But what's one to make of it all? Like the old musician to which it looks back, the structure of the luncheon is additive, an arrangement which has the effect of bringing the issue of intelligibility to the fore, as mentioned earlier. And as we saw, Castagnari was troubled by what he regarded as the inconsistency in the still life, in particular the juxtaposition of the oysters and the coffee. But of course, there's also a glass of wine. Is it clear that these items cannot reasonably go together? What is clear, though, and in line with Castagnari's point, is that both oysters and lemon are there for purely pictorial reasons. More important from my perspective is that the small blue and white sugar bowl at the lower right, on close examination, just about in contact with the right hand framing edge, has its handle extended directly toward the beholder thereby implying a no notional positioning of an ideal viewer directly before it, which is to say, all but directly opposite the right-hand edge of the painting. Granted, this is a small and marginal detail, but it's clearly deliberate on Manny's part. And once it's noticed, once it's allowed a certain pictorial weight, it becomes impossible to ignore. And of course, also in the immediate vicinity of the right-hand edge, indeed emphatically truncated by that edge, is the seated smoker in the top hat, who faces to his right, and in that sense relays the beholder's gaze back across the composition from right to left, i.e. against the implied initial movement in discrete stages from left to right. And the angling of the knife, you see there, protruding past the table edge, contributes to that counter movement. The result is a measured, stage-by-stage -stage distribution of emphasis that extends across the entire expanse of the pictorial field, literally from one edge of the painting to the other. And moreover, that does so in a way that imagines the beholder standing not simply in front of the painting as a whole, opposite its middle, so to speak, but in front of every portion of the canvas, as if he or she were pointedly addressed head on by every discrete element in the painting. The face by every discrete element in the painting. The swords and the helmet, the flower pot, the rubber plant, the maid, a coffee pot with its monogram, Leon Coel in the near foreground with his straw boater, black jacket, shirt and tie. Um, the hanging scroll, the still life with its lemon peel and knife protruding beyond the edge of the table, and its sugar bowl with handle projected toward the beholder. And then finally, the smoking man cut off by the right hand framing edge. In short, what we find is facing this with a vengeance, as if divorced from the actual position of the beholder before the painting. Despite the fact, more importantly, facilitated by the fact that the dominant personage in the composition the one who most commands the viewer's interest, whose elegant, carefully got up costume has been depicted with the greatest attention to texture, color, and detail, has his gaze subtly directed somewhere else, which in effect invites the viewer to subject his features to the closest scrutiny. Indeed, the facing quality of the tablecloth, uh, where it, um, to the young man's right and left, is where it drops down off the table edge. I mean, there. Is brilliantly thematized by the textured pattern of little squares, each of which appears to face the beholder, a kind of tour de force of restrained painterly execution. As for the smoking man, posed for by Manet's summer neighbor, August Roussillon, there's an important sense in which he too represents something new in his case, something anomalous in Manet's art. The art critic Marius Schomelas, so I'm citing another critic, his observations about the luncheon and balcony in his salon of 1869 are revealing here. Here is Schomelas. The first aspect of these two canvases is not agreeable. It must be recognized. The personages, with the exception of the seated woman, he means Bert Morisot in the balcony, are not at all handsome. Their faces have something morose and disagreeable about them, like the faces of persons who pose 
And in fact, all these figures have the air of saying to us, look at me. They think of nothing else. We exclude from this criticism the man waiting for his coffee, who tranquilly digests his luncheon without concerning himself with us. Thus, in general, no expression, no feeling, no composition." End of quotation. Schoenner's remarks are interesting on two counts. First, there's his marked distaste for most of the figures in both canvases, whom he sees as having the quality of persons posing to be painted, and in fact inviting the beholder's attention. Look at me, they seem to be saying. This, of course, expresses his discomfort with Manet's emphasis on facingness, which the painter's contemporaries accustomed to absorptive structures of one sort or another, almost without exception, found disturbing, if not incomprehensible. And second, Chauvelin makes an exception both for Bert Morisot in the balcony and for the smoking man in the luncheon, who digests his meal without concerning himself with us. The latter clause is pure rhetoric of absorption. That's what absorption is supposed to do. Make you feel the figure has no thought for you. The smoker appears lost in thought or reverie or perhaps simply in the pleasures of digestion, the enjoyment of a cigarette, and hence is unaware of being beheld. And because that is so, the fact that the smoking man bears no evident relation to any of the other figures would appear to Chamelin a lesser fault even if the luncheon's failure of composition implicates him too. Indeed, the smoker's absorptive state of mind has a sort of equivalent in the self-involvement of the black cat washing itself. It takes a moment to figure out what the cat is doing, a piece of business that could not be in greater contrast with that of Olympia's glaring feline, the black cat who hisses at us at the lower right of the Olympia. Six. Here's a suggestion, and I'm starting to bring this lecture to a close. The smoking man's apparent absorption in reverie, or simply in smoking or the act of digestion, throws into relief the all but completely impenetrable subjectivity of the young man. Just as the shadow falling on the smoker's brow from the brim of his hat and the gravure painfully touch with which his left hand has been rendered make all the more perspicuous the much more scrupulous execution of the young man's bright and illuminated face. And just as the maid's direct gaze underscores by contrast the young man's off canvas look. And here's the point of my suggestion. What, however resistant to penetration Leon Coelho's subjectivity is felt to be, the beholder nevertheless registers it as a subjectivity, as a form of what philosophers call mindedness, not simply as a mask with vacancy behind it. By way of comparison, consider the two men in the Déjeuner Solaire who can only be seen as perfect nullities without psychic reality of any sort, costumed dummies for all intents and purposes. Or later in Manet's career, the mask-like features of the seated woman in, in the Conservatory of 1879. Victorine Muron in the Déjeuner in the Olympia, and for that matter, the old musician in the painting of that name were a different story within the limits of Manet's characteristic restraint. But Manet in 1868-69 no longer wanted to associate psychic reality with a personage gazing directly out of the painting. Similarly, by an analogous though different logic, in the balcony, the absolute inexpressiveness of the Antoine Guillaume and Fanny Klaus personages throws into relief the significantly different treatment of Bert Morris, whose dark-eyed Spanish physiognomy reigns over the painting, one's gaze continually returns to it, despite the fact that her seeming impassiveness denies the beholder all but minimal imagined access to her inner life. But there's no question that, like Leon Coella, only more so, more indubitably, she has an inner life, though her resistant to empathic identification it's felt to be. The absurd scrap of the dog at Morisot's feet further points up her distinction in that regard. And it matters, too, that both Coella and Morisot are sighted closer to the picture surface than the other figures in the painting. In other words, and this is my final claim, the heart of my reading of both paintings, the luncheon and the balcony are both crucial portraits 
of Leon Coelho, a significant presence in Manet's life, of Greg Morisot, who is soon to become such, and in both cases, Manet's project appears to have been to evoke the mindedness or psychic reality of persons, the depiction of whom, in keeping with the demand for facingness that was one of the staples of his art, would lend itself as little as possible in Coella's case, very nearly not at all, to imaginative penetration on the part of the beholder. Two years later, in Le Repos, a full-length portrait of Berthe Morisot in a white gown and holding a fan seated on a wine-red couch, he allowed himself to portray her thoughtful, not quite happy mood, also her beauty, with consummate suggestiveness. In this sense, Manet's 1865-67 post-Madrid engagement with a single-figure portrait as a basis for his art is not so much rejected as transcended in the new multi-figure works. By the same token, it's surely relevant that the major painting, apart from the execution of Maximilian, that precedes the luncheon is the portrait of Zola, a work that, as already suggested, shares certain features and concerns with its immediate successes. Thus, the writer has been portrayed seated almost exactly in profile, with legs crossed, holding a volume of Charles Blanc's Histoire des Peintres open before him, but instead of looking at the pages, his gaze is directed off to the right, and his face, struck by light to the extent of being almost shadowless, could not be less expressive. The young Odion Redon, an artist, but before he was an artist, he wrote criticism, praised the Zola for its originality, harmony, and elegance of tone, but accused Manny of, quote, sacrificing the man and his thought to a strong execution, to a triumph of the accessories, unquote, concluding that the Zola is, quote, more like a still life than the expression of human character. It would be interesting to know what Manny would have made of Redon's remarks if he'd come across them, which he wouldn't have they appeared in the provincial newspaper, would the notion of sacrifice have resonated with him at all? In any case, the luncheon and the balcony, one might say, correct the Zola. In the first place, by adding other figures, thereby making each not just a portrait, but a tableau, or portrait tableau, a term I introduce late in Manet's modernism to capture something of the complexity of Manet's aspirations. And in the second, by using the additional figures to frame his protagonist's respective subjectivities, by the subtly different pictorial strategies I've tried to spell out. A closing thought. In 1867, Henri Fantin Latour, his admiration for his dauntless and elegant contemporary was unstinting, painted his magisterial portrait of Manet, inscribed à mon ami Manet, today in the Art Institute of Chicago. And six years later, 1873, he painted the equally impressive corner of a table, also in Chicago, a near view of a table covered with a white tablecloth and bearing a crystal decanter of wine, a small decanter, and so on and so forth. What's especially striking, though, is the tall, flowering rhododendron plant in the extreme foreground, this side of the table, very much in the position of Leon Coella in the luncheon in the studio. Is it conceivable? that the corner of a table, too, may be understood as an act of homage to Manet, if not indeed as a simultaneously ironic and the appreciative commentary upon the frequent charge, like Redon's, that Manet's paintings of persons were nothing more than still lives. <laughs> Thank you for your attention.